Thanks for coming, everyone. So just to, to start off, who knows who Jane Jacobs is? This, it, this is always good to, to know. Okay, so there's a couple people who don't. And so this is good. Cool. All right. That's great. That's great, yeah, because it, it means that I get to give the spiel. So, um, so yeah, just for, for anyone who doesn't know, um, I think it's fair to say that Jane Jacobs is one of the most influential uh, urban thinkers of the 20th century. Um, so she's, she's famous for both her writing and also for her activism. Uh, her most famous book is The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which was published in 1961. Um, and it kind of put forth a, a different way of thinking about cities, a different vision for how we might build our cities at a time when um, the urban renewal regime in, in America was really intent on tearing down what they considered to be slums, uh, which were often lower income neighborhoods in cities and replacing them with um, housing projects that were seen to be more spacious, um, you know, uh, cleaner and, and more ordered. Uh, people were very anxious about the chaos of the 19th century industrial city. We're sitting in the corner of an urban renewal area right now, the central classical urban renewal area of Providence. Yeah. So that's kind of, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, she, she wrote this book that said, no, actually, you know, these places that we're building right now don't work. They, they're, they're, they actually ignore the way that cities really function in terms of their economy and in terms of the, their social fabric. Um, and so she said that rather than sorting out all these uses and making everything all spread apart, what we needed were cities that were dense, had a mixture of uses, um, had a good amount of old, cheap buildings, uh, not necessarily, you know, sort of the showcase um, preserved buildings that we often talk about, uh, but, you know, old kind of run-down buildings even. Um, Neon pigs on the wall. Right, yeah. <laughs> this is a great reuse of, of a building. And... Um, and then also short blocks so that it's, it's actually a walkable uh, neighborhood where people can, people's paths can mix. Um, and she saw this as, as these, are, these were the generators of diversity. They, they allowed foot traffic to be generated in neighborhoods, allowed retail to flourish, and, and which opens up um, economic opportunity. And, and also, when people are out on the street and they've lived in a place for a long time, they do eventually get to know each other. So this is the backbone of community, as she saw it. Um, so that was her most famous book, but uh, of course she actually wrote uh, several more. She wrote another, um, let's see, I'm going to get this wrong. Depends on how we count it. Right? Yeah, another, she wrote uh, or authored another seven books and um, edited another two books. Um, and they touched on all sorts of topics, but mostly um, concentrating on economics. She actually considered herself an economist first and foremost. Um, and then also on ethics, particularly uh, professional ethics. What are the moral underpinnings of economic life? That, she was really fascinated by that. Um, and then her final book, which I think you know, Christina was kind of um, alluding to, Dark Age Ahead, uh, <laughs> you can kind of guess by the title, was, was a little bit of a, a pessimistic take on um, where North American culture was going. And um, it was very much about the sort of pillars of our society. Um, so you know, she, she messed around in all sorts of different areas, and I think this book, uh, Vital Little Plans, tries to connect all of those, those pieces. So, you know, explore what, in Jacob's mind, um, city planning has to do with economics, has to do with ethics, um, and as well as bringing in all sorts of other topics that she explored throughout her time um, as a writer, uh, from feminism to environmentalism, um, and really just showing the breadth of her, her thinking. Um, so the other thing that this, this book is hoping to do also is sort of unsettle her legacy while also honoring it. Um, because obviously, I think, I think we all, everyone who knows Jane Jacobs in this room probably has very specific ideas about who she was and what she thought um, and, uh, you know, her impact on the city. But in fact, there's, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of surprising, provocative things in her writing that I think um, I certainly forgot until I started rereading some of it. Um, so I, we're hoping that um, by reading some of these short works, it might spark new interest and different ways of thinking about um, what she thought and what her legacy is. Uh, so tonight, we're going to take you on uh, a 70-year journey from her, her earliest uh, public writings in New York City, which, which happened in uh, the depth of the, the De Great Depression, um, all the way to her unfinished, unpublished uh, book that she was writing when she passed away in 2006. Um, so uh, the very first reading um, geez, is, uh, is a piece called um, 
Flowers Come to Town, which is, <laughs> this, this was written when she first arrived in New York and was sort of hustling uh, to, find, to find writing gigs. Uh, and so she actually wrote this for Vogue magazine, believe it or not. Uh, she, it's part of a series that she was writing about all the wholesale districts in New York. And I find it really interesting because it foreshadows uh, the way she was looking at the city and the death and life of great American cities. Um, in particular, in that book, she talks about this idea of this, the, the ballet of the city sidewalk, uh, which has to do with the way that people um, you know, play their own roles in one place. People come and go as they go to work, or they, they come home from work as they take their kids to school, or go to the park, or go get lunch. And that's what that combination of comings and goings is really what keeps a city sidewalk alive all day. Um, this, this piece also really, I think, connects to her work on economics in that it focuses in on uh, the flower wholesale district in New York and uh, the way that all of these businesses actually interact with one, one another and create this, this network. She, was, she wrote a lot about uh, local economies and the way that uh, they promote innovation um, and economic opportunity. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start reading. All the ingredients of a lavender and old lace story with a rip-roaring contrasting background are in New York's wholesale flower district. Centered around 28th Street and 6th Avenue, under the melodramatic roar of the L, encircled by hash houses and Turkish baths, are the shops of hard-boiled stalwart men who shyly admit that they are dawdles for love, sentiment, and romance. Apprentices dodging among the handcarts that are forever rushing to or from the fur and garment districts dream of the time when they will have their own commission houses. Greeks and Koreans confessing that they have the hearts of children build little Japanese gardens. Greenhouse owners declare that they would not sell at any price the flowers which grow in their own backyards. A dealer plans how to improve the business that grandfather, that grandfather started, and orchids in milk bottles nod at field flowers in buckets. Early in the morning, the market opens. From five o'clock on, boxes and hampers of flowers are brought into the district and unloaded. Most of them from Long Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey arrive in the city via truck. But those from Florida, California, and Canada come by fast express, and those from South America and Holland by ship. Occasionally, a shipment of gardenias is flown from California by airplane. For most of the morning, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cut flowers and blossoming shrubs fill the shops and overflow onto the sidewalk. Their damp, sweet perfume blowing across the pavement filters from hampers and crates piled beside doorways. By noon, most of the flowers have been taken away by retail florists or peddlers, and in the afternoon, the rest are put in storage or set to other markets. Then the cool, sweet-smelling shops have an empty, leisurely air. A few buckets of peonies and lilacs splash against the dark walls, and the proprietors and workers sitting on the high metal top tables, their feet dangling, smoke and talk. The wholesale market started about 55 years ago, well within the memory of the older dealers. At that time, most of the growers lived on Long Island and brought their flowers over in market baskets every morning. They were met by the retail florists at the ferry landing at 34th Street and the East River. As competition sharpened, the growers appeared earlier and earlier in the morning. And in order to get the choicest flowers, the florists also appeared earlier and earlier until the first sales were made in the middle of the night. <laughs> Near the docks was a place called Dan's Restaurant, run by a horse car conductor and kept open all night for the patronage of other conductors. Flower buyers and sellers began to drift in there to conclude their dickering until finally they used it to house a fairly well-organized market. The first rule adopted was that no one could take the cover off his basket until a gong rang at six o'clock. In a few years, some of the growers started a competing market at 23rd Street. Then both groups leased a building at 26th Street and 6th Avenue. The New York Cut Flowers Association was formed and located on the second floor of the building. Other growers took the third floor. Before the growers brought their flowers uh, to 34th Street, retail florists had to go to the, the country themselves to buy, if they could, what their customers wanted. Sometimes they didn't succeed and had to substitute sentiment. One early florist commissioned to get 19 pink roses for a girl's birthday could, only, uh, could find among all the nearby growers only 18 blossoms and one very tight little bud. So with the bouquet, he sent a card, 
for 18 happy years and one to come. Two actresses, uh, two actresses and an act, yeah, two actresses and an actor, uh, Lotta Crabtree, Clara Morris, and Lester Wallach, financed what is now the oldest floral house in Manhattan and established it in the lobby of the old Wallach Theater in the Bowery, where it became the favorite sh flower shop of a generation of theatrical people. At first, its most popular flowers, and sometimes the only ones in stock, were pond lilies, picked by uh, Mr. Lemu, Le <laughs> uh, the proprietor in Washington Heights and Westchester. This shop, like perhaps a third of the wholesale houses, is managed by the grandson of the founder. Most of the other dealers are former employees or sons of employees of these first flower merchants and played among the roses and cornflowers and daffodils before they were old enough to help. Occasionally, an overzealous heir brings on catastrophe. One boy, home from college, thought he would help by sprinkling the, or the orchids. Um, he ruined $3,000 worth before he realized he was giving them the treatment for gardenias. Behind the brownstone fronts on 28th Street are basket factories, most of which are owned by Greeks, Italians, or Orientals. Re uh, reeds, wooden discs, and scrap uh, scraps of wicker are piled haphazardly in halls and on stairways and in the old high-ceilinged rooms. The baskets are sold in the florist accessories shops, which share the district with the wholesale flower houses and supply ribbons, pottery, terrariums, and even artificial flowers. The wholesale dealer's business is done entirely on commission. They, the middlemen for the growers and retailers, sell to established florists and to sidewalk vendors and peddlers. During Easter week, approximately 12,000 boxes of daffodils, 10 dozen in a box, were sold to peddlers alone. A phenomenon of the last year or two is the successful chain of subway flower vendors. They buy cheaper flowers in quantity, have very little overhead, and on a good weekend, they make as much as $30,000. New Yorkers buy tremendous amounts of cut flowers and foliage. Each year, they purchase about 1,200 million ferns. 200. 200 million, sorry. <laughs> Still, 200 That's million ferns. That's a lot ferns. of ferns. It's a lot of ferns. Either way, um, you cut it. One firm keeps 120,000 <laughs> firms on hand at all times. And in season, one grower sends in 20,000 do uh, dozen iris a day, and another 150,000 roses. All the large passenger liners are supplied from the New York market, and on her eastward trips, the Hindenburg, too, carries flowers from 28th Street. Portents of doom, the yeah. Hindenburg. Dead soon after this. <laughs> All those poor flowers. Uh, growers devote a good deal of time to breeding new varieties and are able to protect their creations with patents. They also attempt to produce flowers out of season. Last year, several growers competed with early chrysanthemums, chrysanthemums from California by fooling their plants into thinking autumn had come. Every day, for a few hours, they shut out the sun with heavy black canopies. It worked. The whole flower business is based on supply and demand. With no set prices and the supply, uh, the, and the supply must start far, far ahead of the demand. Occasionally, among all the hundreds of varieties, it is impossible to find a fairly commonplace flower, and a florist may hunt in vain for a dozen white roses or yellow snapdragons. Excellent. So that piece uh, came in 1936 or seven, seven, um, and was, as Nate said, as part of when Jane Jacobs was really struggling to become a writer as a young woman, just moved to New York, no college degree, straight out of high school, trying to, to make a beat for herself. And she was finding that what her beat would be in the end was city life and the way that city life produced these economic niches that, that Nate talked about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward us about uh, exactly 30 years to 1967. So to the other side of the uh, death and life of great American cities, uh, when she has established herself as a writer and a thinker and as someone who is uh, more interested in, rather than the kind of local color that in that piece leads her to some sort of mild amounts of humor and some forms of uh, sort of uh, period uh, kind of color around orientals and things like that, right? There's a lot, a lot of that sort of stuff that we would find um, outdated during those years uh, to, to being someone who thinks about ideas um, and who thinks about uh, uh, essays that are provocative and, and are about convincing people um, to think in the way she does about cities and to expand on the set of ideas that she promoted in um, that she promoted in Death and Life of Great American Cities, and particularly to start to try to try to start thinking about what city economies are about. 
And so this essay that I'm going to read from is called The Self-Generating Growth of Cities. It was actually a speech that she gave at the Royal Institute of British Architects in London in February of 1967. And it's when she's working out the ideas that would later show up in her second book, um, The Economy of Cities. OK, and it starts this way. It is really ridiculous. We literally know more about the processes that go on in the sun than we do about the processes that go on in our cities. Mankind has lived in them for thousands upon thousands of years, and we do not really know much about how they work. A few years ago, I became curious about why some cities stagnate economically, which means they stagnate in every other way too, and why some cities go on for extraordinarily long times without stagnating. I became interested in this because in America, the stagnating cities, such as Detroit, Pittsburgh, and many smaller cities, are a terrible problem. Their problems pile up faster than they can be dealt with. London, I very much admire. In fact, I am practically awestruck by London, not only for the obvious reasons, but because in historic and probably prehistoric times, London has had a longer period of uninterrupted, self-generating economic growth than any other city in the world. It has gone on longer without stagnation than Rome or Paris. Study of it and of how it has generated new economic activities would pay, not just for Englishmen, but for all mankind. Now, when I got into this question, I did not know where to begin. I knew that there was a question here, but the customary answers to it are superficial. If you compare them, you find there is no pattern. The answers are not known. I made a hypothesis that a city is not stagnating economically, excuse me, a city that, that, a, that a city that is not stagnating economically is a city that is continually casting forth new kinds of economic activity. And it does not matter whether the enterprises are privately owned or publicly owned, it is more fundamental that the arrangement of who controls things and who supplies, um, it is more fundamental than the arrangement of who controls things and who supplies the money. The question arises, why do some cities produce these new things? Why are some cities creative only for a time and then halt? If you think about these things in the abstract, you get nowhere, or else kid yourself. I decided that perhaps the best way to get a little light on the problem was to read the histories of successful businesses by early historians, especially those that were innovations at the time, in the hope that some pattern uh, of what was important would emerge. I found out that there were patterns, and they were com completely surprising to me. The dominant pattern that began to emerge was something I had never remotely anticipated. These business histories became awfully tiresome. It was like reading the same three historical novels, novels over and over again. The characters wore different clothing and had different uh, accoutrements around them at different periods, but they were the same old three stories. As these were American business histories, I wondered if this was quite special to us and decided uh, to try a different place and time. What better place than London in medieval times? Luckily for me, I read the wonderful account written at the turn of the century by George Unwin of the guilds and companies of economic importance in, in Tudor and Stuart times. There, sure enough, were the same three plots. I looked farther afield. Japan, Russia, and China seem to have the same three plots. I have not yet found a fourth. It may very well be there, but I have not found it. The strange pattern that I did not expect was that new economic activities come out of internal economies of cities. Cities are not just great lumps of chaos. They are a form of very intricate, very wonderful order. And they seem like chaos mainly because we do not understand this order nor the processes by which it works. Now here I'm going to skip ahead because uh, Jacobs at this point goes into a very detailed uh, description of the, very, of the economic processes that drive, according to her, city life. And I'll let you come back and read that in the self-generating growth of cities yourself. Um, and I'm going to skip to the end. Um, every kind of a problem comes to a head in cities, she says, summing up uh, the way that cities promote their own economic growth. The problem of disease, that was just the same in the country as in cities in one way, but it came to a head in cities because their epi epidemics could affect so many people, travel so swiftly, and so on. So that is where it had to be, uh, had so urgently to be solved. Air and water pollution, transportation, or even any of our social problems are not as difficult to solve as those that were solved in overcoming epidemics in cities. If we look at problems in this way, we can see that they are opportunities for cities. A city that actually, that begins actually solving, not evading the air pollution problem, uh, will begin to export devices for controlling air pollution in other cities that have not managed to solve this for their own internal economy. And that's actually sort of the model of her idea of economic growth in cities, that cities will begin to produce for themselves and then export those ideas uh, to other cities. 
So far from our denigrating cities because of the problems they create, we should recognize that these problems are opportunities. What we call faults of cities are really bringing problems to a head where they can be solved. The only terrible thing is when cities fall down on the job that only cities can do and stop solving these problems within their own internal economies and then exporting their solutions to other places. A great deal of the notion that is so current in planning that large numbers of people collecting in one place are unwholesome should be discouraged. The countries that have these great cities have made the most progress at many times. Countries that are mainly villages have not. Life keeps casting up new problems, and the cities have been, and certainly will continue to be, the places where they can be solved. Great. So um, I'm going to read another piece, actually, from this same sort of time period. So uh, this is after she published Death and Life. It's also after she published two other books, The Economy of Cities and another one on uh, Quebec separatism, uh, which is kind of an interesting detour that, believe it or not, ties into her other work later. Um, but th this speech uh, called Can Big Plans Solve the Problem of Renewal was an instance where she was asked to sort of play the hits. Um, you know, she was best known for the death and life of great American cities, and so people often asked her to talk about those issues, talk about urban design again, city planning again. Um, and so she does this in the speech while also kind of tying it into what she was thinking about at the time. And that's what I think is really interesting about it. Um, so I'm going to start about halfway through, but just to give you a little background, she's given, at this point, she's given um, an account of why she believes that little plans uh, are superior to big plans, um, that big plans are, are sort of, you know, boring, stultifying, inflexible, and so forth. Um, and now she's going to give some examples of what exactly she's talking about that I think are particularly interesting uh, for this audience, uh, you know, in terms of preservation, in terms of how we build new places that we actually want to preserve. Um, so, uh, so it look, actually, Christian, some people already have books. Do you want to tell them what page this sure. is on? We didn't do that before, but I see some <laughs> folks looking on. So, yeah. Sure. So if you're looking for where I'm starting, it's page 230. Um, great. All right. And I should also note the title of this book uh, comes from a variation on this speech, actually. Um, and you know, whether you're talking about urban design or you're talking about uh, economics, really the sort of overlying idea behind Jane, a lot of Jane Jacobs' theories is that people should be allowed to make their own little plans. Uh, so on that, life is an ad hoc affair. It has to be improvised all the time because of the hard fact that everything we do changes what is. This is distressing to people who would like to see things beautif uh, beautifully planned out and settled once and for all. That cannot be. Does all this mean that trying to plan is useless? No, of course not. Trying to use foresight, which is what planning is, is obviously so necessary and useful that most of us are practicing it constantly. We plant daffodil bulbs in October and set the alarm clock at night. We can plan for our renewal of cities too, but what I am proposing is that we practice making little plans for that purpose, not big ones. I think we need to relearn the art of doing that and that there are ways to relearn it. To explain what I mean, I will tell uh, how the practice of renewal planning has gradually changed in my own city, Toronto. I am using Toronto not because it is necessarily avant-garde or has all the answers. It doesn't. Nobody does, and no place does. But we have been getting a glimmer there of how to plan for little plans, uh, even for large collections of little plans on big sites. And for that reason, and because I have watched the change come firsthand, I'll tell a story about Toronto. The story begins in 1973, when citizens' anger against big planning there boiled over one chilly spring morning before dawn on a dilapidated street where, the day before, um, employees of a building wrecking company had erected a high board fence around 20 old houses that were to be demolished and had begun crashing holes in the roof of the most beautiful house right in the center of the group. These houses, although they were neglected and run down, were interesting and human looking in comparison with what uh, was to go up in their place. Six identical apartment towers planned by the province's housing ministry for low income and tenants. Actually, the plan for the new housing was not a big plan as such things go. It occupied not quite half of a single long city block, but it looked like a big plan. It shouted monotony, stultification, and flexibility. The people gathered in the pre-dawn dark 
that morning to protest what was planned, uh, what, pl what was planned came from, the neighbor from neighborhood organizations far and wide across the city. They weren't against low-income housing. They were against big plans and things that looked like big plans, which bit by bit had been destroying the fabric of the city. They had no plan for how to stop this scheme, except to plead with the wrecking workmen to stay their hands. But as they stood talking together and stamping their feet in the cold, waiting for the workmen to come, somebody mentioned that it is illegal to wreck buildings unless a fence has been put up around them. Incidentally, in other tellings of the story, it's Jean Jacobs who actually said that. Um, the remark was repeated from person to person and group to group, and without another word, everyone began taking action. You'd be amazed at how rapidly and purposefully several hundred men, women, and children with no one directing them can dismantle a sturdily built fence and turn it back to neatly piled stacks of lumber. <laughs> when the workmen arrived, just as the last boards were being stacked, they couldn't do anything until they had rebuilt the fence. The mayor of Toronto, when he learned what had happened, used the few hours of grace the protesters had won to persuade the provincial housing authorities to hold their plan in abeyance uh, while he explored alternatives. The provincial authorities agreed, provided that an alternative cost no more than their scheme and would provide as many housing units. <clears throat> they did not expect those provisions to be met because big planning had stifled their own imaginations and sense of ingenuity. But over the next few weeks, the mayor, the city's commissioner uh, of housing, and one of the city's most brilliant firms of architects did plan what was supposedly impossible. Their alternate scheme saved all the old houses and converted their interiors into new flats. The rest of the housing required, which was most of it, was put into new buildings inserted in the backyards. The new buildings had to be ingeniously, even a little crazily, worked into the space, and so did lanes and little courtyards. Furthermore, to make the thing fit, the apartments couldn't be more or less duplicates of each other. The scheme, because of the very limitations the site imposed when the old buildings remained, had to embrace a variety of accommodations, from dwellings for families with children on lower floors to apartments for single people, uh, for elderly couples, and even in one of the old houses, a boarding house for elderly men. Standardization of any sort wouldn't work on a site so difficult, but variety would. Getting this alternative accepted was not easy. Even after the provincial authorities agreed to it, there were struggles with federal bureaucracy, the lending of the building funds. The width of every courtyard and lane had to be defended, and even the size and placement of some of the windows. Nevertheless, the city by standing firm won its points. The thing was built. It has now been occupied for almost six years and fits so well into the neighborhood and so much adds to its interest in, instead of distracting from it that the old houses across the street which had also been run down and dilapidated, uh, have now been bought up and rehabilitated privately. No such renewing effect as, uh, as that occurred on streets bordering this, the city's big planned projects. The builder of a luxury project in another part of the city so much liked what uh, was being done in this poorer section that he too set his project behind a row of old buildings, linking them with lanes. This is the only instance I know of in North America in which an expensive building copied a low-income building. The success of this first publicly financed infill housing project led the city to seek out other awkward sites for scattered little plans. Every site was difficult, or every site was different, with different planning problems. In all cases, the old buildings were left, not destroyed, no matter what limitations that imposed. Sometimes the old buildings nearby were incorporated in the new schemes, and rehabilitated too. In other cases, the new buildings were simply inserted among the old in what had been vacant lots or parking lots. Some of the infill buildings, uh, building has been high, most of it is low. But high or low, these little plans have all been used to knit together again places of the city, pieces of the city fabric that had become frayed or unraveled. What, that is one form of city renewal, knitting up the little holes. But what about the very big holes? What about the sites that seem to demand big planning because they are big sites? In Toronto, some of the, uh, the parts of the city that have needed renewal most are huge areas near the waterfront, which were first blighted by the railroads, then by the expressway, uh, expressways bordering the railroad, um, were taken over by industries and then abandoned by industries, leaving them as wastelands of junkyards, parking lots, and weed-grown vacant spaces interspersed here and there with an old industrial building, a warehouse, a transformer station. Just such a great tract was chosen by the city for renewal in 1975, a tract so large that the construction would have to take place in phases, 
requiring, it was thought, about 15 years for completion. Only a few years later, the city planners and politicians would have assumed that to do anything here, they must first make a comprehensive, detailed plan for the whole thing. But the planners, administrators, and politicians who had already previously worked on the infill schemes um, I, I have told you about uh, had been changed by that experience. Now they respected little plans, ingenuity, opportunism, variety, and from uh, their infill experience, they had learned new ways of thinking about planning itself. For this big tract, they did not work out a big finished plan, but instead a scheme that would be hospitable to many little plans. For this, they used five major devices. First, instead of thinking of the big tract as a place in its own right to be set apart from the city, they thought of it just as another piece of city fabric to be knit into the existing city on its north, east, and west. They could not knit it on the south because there it was cut off from the railroad or by the railroad and the expressway. So first they planned streets that would attach the tract into existing city streets without a break. They forgot uh, everything they had learned in school about planning cul-de-sacs and about buffering off residential areas with figurative do not disturb signs and laid out streets inside the tract that connect every part with every other part. These streets, real city streets, not fake suburban or country streets, together with a long narrow spine of park or commons running through the tract from end to end are the skeleton of the plan. Second, apart from providing this skeleton, they did not try to plan the whole tract from the start. They planned only the first phase to be built and planned even that loosely. Apart from choosing a location for a combination school and apartment house, a mixed use building, they contented themselves with designating some streets for low buildings and some streets, uh, street locations for high buildings. Third, they left to developers and their architects how the buildings were to look uh, and what kinds of dwellings they were to contain. The, de the developers include, to be sure, the city's own housing department, but they also include a great variety of independently run housing cooperatives and private developers as well. Some of the housing is for rent to residents, some is for sale. If the developers want to mix stores, restaurants, or theaters in with the housing, they can. That is part of leaving room for little plans. There is no shopping center. Shops turn up where other minds uh, than those of the planners think they will be successful. Fourth, the planners gave thought to other aspects of flexibility. In buildings uh, developed under the city's own supervision, what is today a house for a family can potentially be recycled into flats in the future and vice versa. What is now housing can potentially be recycled into shops in the future, just as happens in a living, changing city, which isn't going to take off for Saturn. It's a reference to something earlier. <laughs> uh, other developers have been encouraged to think in terms of adaptability too. And fifth, the few old brick industrial buildings scattered about in the site, which had been thought of previously as part and parcel of its blight, were not demolished to create a clean slate. Every one of them is cherished, to be recycled and to help provide a few links with the past and its fashions in building. The fact that the tract contains so little from the past was not thought of as an asset, but as its chief deficiency. The first of the recycled industrial buildings is now occupied by housing and shops and a, hands uh, a handsome building it is. Significantly enough, even before the site was chosen for renewal, one of the old industrial buildings had already been recycled into a beautiful uh, young people's theater, and of course it remains. About a third of the tract is now completed and occupied and its streets are delightful, full of variety with surprises around every corner. It is so popular and successful that the building of the rest is proceeding faster than the planners had at first supposed was feasible. Recently, I asked the architect who had been employed in the city's housing office to lay out the street skeleton and park and choose the school site uh, what he thought would go on a, particular, a particularly prominent spot still untouched. I have no idea, he said. Nobody knows at this point. All we know is that when the right idea comes along, the city will probably recognize it. We don't have to decide until then, just for the sake of deciding. We don't have any monopoly on ideas for this neighborhood. Why should we? All right. Nice. So that's actually an excerpt from that essay. And the two sites that Nate talked about, if you know Toronto, are um, Sherborne Lanes Housing, which is the site that was saved from the bulldozers in that first story. And the second one is um, the St. Lawrence neighborhood. So if you've been to Toronto and, and walked through some of those places, you may recognize them. So now we're going to fast forward to the, the very last, uh, I think it's the last public appearance that Jane Jacobs uh, ever, ever made in New York City in 2004, two years before she died. 
Um, and I'm going to read some excerpts from the, the speech that she gave that day at um, City College of New York. Uh, it was called The End of the Plantation Age. I was actually there that day, um, and I remember it, although I don't remember much about what she said. Um, it's, a very, uh, it's a very rambly talk. Um, she was quite advanced in age. Um, but once you sit down to read it, it's actually quite interesting and, and quite fascinating piece of work because, as Nate mentioned, it represents her last moment of thinking and the last uh, set of ideas she was working on, which were, uh, in some sense, an answer to or an or alternative to her last book, Dark Age Ahead. And this idea that, um, that perhaps we had reached the end of the plantation age was her look back at the long scope of human history and what potentially could be coming ahead if it were not to be a dark age ahead. And in the excerpt that I'm going to read, she talks a little bit about that. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of jumping in in the middle here. This talk has a bunch of things in it. It has a whole bunch of stuff about Louis Mumford, who was her bete noir and urbanist, uh, urbanist uh, debates of, of the earlier uh, years. And it has some stuff about skyscrapers, something she had never written much about before. It has a lot of stuff in it. But um, let me start about this bit about the plantation age. Beginning with the emergence of agriculture and animal husbandry some 10 or 12,000 years ago, the agrarian age got underway. Those of you who have read Jared Diamond's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, will recall Diamond's brilliant analyses of why the large and dense populations of successful agrarians defeated older hunting and gathering societies, and also why agrarians more successful at producing food consistently won military victories over societies less successful at doing so. But even if you have not read Diamond, you are surely aware that foragers have lost out so universally to agrarians that foraging cultures are now almost extinct. Greeting card publishers, illustrators of children's books, buyers of the cards and books, and many others enjoy sentimentalizing agrarian life with jolly portrayals of snug family farms. But in most times and most places, family farms have seldom been able to provide a decent subsistence living even for their proprietary families. And even when they have produced cash crops, the yields have been usually been marginal additions to the wealth and power of conquering agrarians. Although Diamond does not say so, the powerhouses of agrarian supremacy were plantations. In the Middle East, nearly uh, early plantations supported the earliest empires, Sumer, Babylon, Assyria. In classical Rome and its conquered and annexed territories, large estates owned by, owned by large-scale importers and exporters were outproducing Rome's family farms, which were traditionally lands granted as pensions to military veterans. Family farms were vanishing even before the Republic vanished. Successful plantations and less successful family farms all but disappeared during the Dark Age that followed Rome's imperial collapse. When Western Europe emerged from its famous Dark Age about a thousand years ago, it was as territories and cultures organized by warlords and abbots into feudal estates, some of which became agrarian cores of successor European empires. Wherever imperial agrarian powers conquered, they took along with them the arts of plantation organization. Practices perfected in the vineyards and grain, flax, olive, and almond plantations of the old world were transferred to other climates as plantations for sugar, cotton, indigo, tea, coffee, cocoa, tobacco, coconuts, pineapples, rubber, opium, poppies, opium poppies, excuse me, peanuts, bananas, space, spices, soybeans, and much else, along with herds, some with summer and winter pasturage as large as small nations. Vestiges of that ancient dynamic continue still. Numbers of North American family farms continue dwindling year after year, while numbers and sizes of the modern plantations we call agribusinesses and factory farms continue to increase. Even cranberry bogs have become efficient plantations. Musician friends tell me that the reeds used worldwide for oboes and other wind instruments come from plantations in southern France where canes grow thickly to heights of 40 feet. Papyrus plantations, now long extinct in Egypt, may once have presented scenes similar to these modern cane plantations. But the plantation age is no longer supreme. It has become the turn of agrarian cultures to be defeated by warriors using ingenuities of the age of human capital. Some people call the young post-agrarian age the knowledge age, implying that we know everything needful. Of course, we don't. Every age has used whatever information and misinformation its people have acquired for better or worse trying to make out what post-agrarian life portends for the future by noticing what has already happened, many people pes pessimistically expect ever more cruel and dangerous ingenuities punctuated by uncontrollable epidemics, irreversible climate changes, interminable civil wars, and other catastrophes. And that's sort of a sum up of some of the things she's talked about in Dark Age Ahead. 
Other people optimistically expect an unprecedentedly creative age, grounded in the emerging science of complexity, which recognizes that everything is connected inexorably to everything else, whether we like that or not and recognizes also that we cannot understand biology or social sciences, or for that matter, physics, by means of the old and, in, and inadequate science of bivariant simplicity and the statistics of disorganized complexity. The optimists looking at what has already happened still manage to find plausible portents that constructive creativity is in ascendancy and will win out. Maybe this is wishful thinking. And the only definitive thing to be said echoes Charles Dickens' introductory comment to A Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times and the best of times, right? So she's reversing that, I think, right? Um, despite the plantation age's many remaining ugly residues, such as racism, that age was slowly but inexorably undermined by skills, observations, and cultural changes that gradually accrued during the past thousand years. For one thing, bread baskets that formerly fed much of the world are no longer economic, economic assets to their nations, but have become instead serious drags on national economies. For instance, rural Sicily, rural Argentina, Uruguay, and Euro Ukraine. In their time, the great North American prairies rendered many smaller bread baskets redundant, such as New England, upstate New York, and the Ottawa Valley and Atlantic provinces of Canada. Now redundancy threatens even the prairies. Already they soak up such huge protectionist subsidies that these led to complete breakdown of the latest attempted round of world trade negotiations. This must have been in the early 2000s. Of course, we still need to eat and clothe ourselves, and millions are not well-fed or well-clad, but attempts to solve or even to understand that enigma as a simplistic flaw in distribution are no longer credible in poor countries receiving foreign aid, nor to increasing numbers of aid givers either. If nothing succeeds like success, it is equally true that nothing fails like failure. For another indication of the plantation age's demise, an exorbitant share of a population is no longer needed to produce food and fiber for itself and others. In advanced economies like America's and Canada's, only about 4% of the working population actually farms or herds, and even some of those only part-time. In poorer economies, where traditionally as much as 80 or 85% of the population was destined to work with crops or pastures, as soon as tractors and irrigation pumps and pipes become available, abundant farm work decreases drastically. Thus, wars of expansion or colonization can no longer be won in the same sense as in the plantation age. In the past, victors could and did consign losers to plantations, ordering them to do as they were told and shut up. But because of agrarian redundancies, an unimaginable luxury in the plantation age, plantation making has lost its point for conquerors. It doesn't pay. Furthermore, some military losers have adopted or created horrible ingenuities of their own. Land can be held exclusively. So can other natural resources like oil wells, fisheries, and gold ores be held. Ingenuity cannot be. The great achievement of the plantation age was the stupendous multiplication of members of our species. <laughs> the good growing successes um, on, on unprecedentedly large scales may have saved our species from early extinction, extinction that could have followed extinctions of wild crops and food animals. The plantation age did not generate many economic ideas valid for our times and economies. Those taken for granted were based only on what worked for agrarian imperialists. The biggest idea came directly out of agrarian experiences of poor harvests. This idea is that relationships exist among supply, demand, and prices. What abundant is cheap and can be disposed of with little or no regret in distinction from rarities. Forests were seen to be abundant. Also, ominously, soil, water, and fresh air were abundant, therefore cheap and disposable. Many people still think this way. Abundant human life could be construed as cheap and disposable. Otherwise, ordinary patriotic citizens came to accept and to even glorify prodigious slaughters such as trench warfare, mustard gas attacks, contrived famines, blitzkrieg, kamikaze and napalm attacks, genocide, ethnic cleansing, jihad, suicide terrorism, landmines, and wholesale lethal dislocation of people from their homes when their presences had become inconvenient to crazed visions of crazed but persuasive super patriots. The attempt to escape difficulties by invoking death instead of by calling up the powers and resources of life was the great shame of the plantation age during its own dying throes. I'll let you read the rest of that in. <laughs> Thanks. We're, we're happy to take questions.
came in late, I'm sorry about that, but um, in your penultimate reading, you jumped 30 years, I believe, into the 60s, and she characterized Detroit at that time as stagnant. And my recollection is that the 50s were really, for Detroit, the golden age. And that continued into the 60s. There were intimations. The 60s was when we started to get imports. Volkswagen came in and other European cars. But Detroit was still pretty healthy. I don't think it began its decline until a bit later. So I, one of the really interesting things about Jacobs is, is her definition of stagnation is not what we would usually think of. And so she, she differentiated stagnation from, say, um, like a depression or, or a recession uh, in the sense that really it's more about economic creativity. And so what was missing in Detroit when, at the time that she was writing was the fact that it was a monoculture. It was a plantation. It was a plantation, her. right? If you yeah. want to use that terminology, it's uh, it was for her. Yeah, for her, it was it was one industry that dominated everything, uh, and you know, fairly presciently, she said that's a problem because if that goes, you know, nothing's process. coming up they the pipeline. Small cars. They got yeah, the right. Far too late. right, right, and, and they, also it could be said that Detroit was a Detroit was a was was. Worked for some people and didn't for others by the middle of the 1960s, right? 67, when that essay comes from, is the year of the Detroit race riots, right? It's a year in which, mm. it's the year in which Detroit's problems, which were underlying, were starting to suddenly make them manifest, and they were manifest in an uneven fashion, particularly for African Americans and not for white people at this point. White people were able to leave the city of Detroit for the suburbs. Black people were caught there in, by discrimination in the housing market and were. Uh, and, and were the particularly uh, acute victims of the deindustrialization and the uh, automation and the movement of capital that was already underway for, for what was st starting to become the Rust Belt City. That would not become apparent to most observers um, until the 70s and 80s of, on a national scale, but it was apparent on a regional scale um, for uh, particularly African American uh, residents, working class residents of cities like Detroit. Now, this is not what Jacobs tells us. I'm an urban historian, so I'm just giving you my <laughs> shtick. It's like the lecture I gave last week. But um, that's. But I think Jacobs was trying to give us a, a sense of um, a sense of of her, just as Nate says, her sense of 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 how you how you think about what prosperity is, how you think about what creativity is. And in some sense, yes, exactly. Like she would have said, well, they didn't adapt. They didn't think about how to to diversify their economy. They just they went with the monoculture mold. And she thought many places did that, right? She. She, she thought uh, for Detroit's entire history, it was a stagnant economy, right? Even though it, did, well, it was the arsenal of a kind of prosperity. She, she would, I think she would have said, I think she does say actually in one of the books, maybe The Economy of Cities, that its golden age was sort of, I think like the early 1900s, mm. when it was converting its shipbuilding economy, I think. It's Lake Erie, sort of Lake Yeah, it's sort of Lake Erie Lake Michigan, ecosystem yeah. of, of, of stuff Erie, happening, all these different producers, it was sort of, uh, transitioning from that into the automobile economy. Right. And the worst a, thing it did was adopt the automobile economy as its dominant thing. Right? Well, just Superman, just yeah. just that that it, it kind of it went from an open ended kind of change to to a race between it and and other other places and all it was they only had one sort of economic line going at once. She right? loved that kind of thing in her books, right? She has she has these comparisons where she she favors New York's kind of industrial economy, which is a small shop economy. Uh, sort of a small, small uh, fabric, and she liked Birmingham and didn't like Manchester and that kind of thing. Uh, right, right. Which, right. In, which is funny because Birmingham didn't do so well by the 70s yeah. and 80s either. But um, <laughs> that's for other reasons about things that she didn't always presciently see, having to do with deindustrialization and, and again and race um, and immigration. But anyway, so. So Jane Jacobs were in charge of the 195. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> what would be happening? Can we uh, leave now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you go ahead on that. Sure. One. Okay. I I'll, live here, so I'll I don't put wanna, my foot in my mouth. All right. I don't um, want to get held to anything. I mean, I think the St. Lawrence idea is is interesting. The idea that really maybe there shouldn't be a plan. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's what she would say. I don't know. I. I, I I never, I've been told by people who knew Jane Jacobs, you should never say what Jane Jacobs would have said because she would always surprise you. Right. And so who knows? But, um, but I do think that the St. Lawrence uh, neighborhood in Toronto provides an interesting example where rather than sort of laying it all out and saying, this is where all the uses are going to be, we're going to put really tight restrictions on, on what can be where, you start somewhere, uh, probably somewhere that, that maybe is closest to downtown, 
um, that, and has sort of adjacent uses already, has streets that are, that are connecting to that neighborhood, and you start building out from there, and you do it fairly gradually and opportunistically. Right. You know, create, a, create a, a structure to take advantage of what's already there, and, uh, and then be opportunistic. Right. I think the difficulty that we have is that Toronto during those years was in, uh, in a relative time of prosperity, right? Yes. Relative prosperity and able to attract um, small forms of investment and small uh, developers plus city agencies that had the money to build on their own and they could mix all that in together. We obviously have a situation in which we are having to do work of all kinds of um, unsavory sorts to try to get people to, to build here, right? Um, right? And we know what that leads to and we've, we have a lot of history with this problem of subsidizing certain forms of building and losing our money in doing so. Um, but that's the game, right? That's the real estate development game in the United States. One of the things that Jacobs wrote much about, about the, about the, the unfortunate way that the private-public combination, uh, while it does some good things and is a way of funneling money into our economy, uh, tends, to, tends to produce stagnant kinds of economies. Um, now, uh, you know, on the other hand, the, the, the St. Lawrence development can seen, be seen itself as a form of public-private partnership, and sure. I wonder how she would have uh, reacted to that notion. Uh, but, you know, I think... Uh, I think what one thing that we can think about is thinking about how you how you give um, the the people who already have some kind of stake in the surrounding neighborhoods and in the city uh, at large some kind of role to play in thinking about what happens in a neighborhood uh, like that and give them their a chance to participate in these, these in open ended plans. So I guess um, you know I think uh, given the conditions we have, we've done some interesting attempts to try to bring. You know, projects to the city, and I can't sort of feel too terribly about that. But on the other hand, I feel like they are a little bit uh, sort of, um, what's the right phrase? I don't know, spur of the moment sort of ideas about what the, the sort of stamp of what, here's what you do for urban development. You get some biotech firms and you put them down because they do that up there in Cambridge. Okay, let's do it here. Um, and we tend to be doing a, a lot of that copycat kind of stuff around here mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the big stuff. We do other innovative stuff much better on our own without worrying about what other cities are doing, but that tends to be from the bottom up. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It would be nice to see what we could do with a little more imagination and less, uh, less of just uh, call some New York developers or some, some Cambridge biotech firms to do, to do what they do elsewhere and put glass up everywhere. Not that I think that one or two of those things is not the end of the world. I don't know how I felt about it. I'm at odds with my colleague Dietrich Neumann about the, about the height of those yeah. three towers, but we're not going to get into that. I mean, I do, um, yeah, I do he's think... He's for it. I'm sort of against it, but I, don't, I do like density, and I think we do need many more people in, in the city of Providence. Yeah, I do, you know, I mean, there's the idea behind the, the 195 lands, I guess, is that it, it was supposed to be some kind of innovation district, and that's part of why, it, you know, the biotech firms and so forth, you know, yeah. are, are part of that idea. But uh, if we're going to imitate an, a, a, uh, an innovation district, we shouldn't look at, to the South Boston waterfront because it's the way that it's been built up is kind of disastrous. It's, it's, the scale is all wonky. It's, I mean, the buildings aren't even all that tall, but they're basically just giant cubes. Chunks. Yeah, just yeah. giant. There's no sort of grain to it at all. Um, if you're going to look at the way that something, something like that has built up, take a look at Kendall Square, which is not perfect, but is much more, has much more of that human scale and, and, and you know, a, a dense diversity of, right. of businesses and, right. you know, it's, it's a more interesting kind of place. And I think anyway. to their credit, that's what they're going for. So we hope, hope it pans Fingers out crossed. nicely. <laughs> yeah. um, in those times from the 60s into the, you know, matter, she, you know, there was this parallel movement in the ecological planning, you know, which, you know, relish diversity. And cities were even seen as, you know, like Seattle was a Boeing city, you know, this was considered great in before the 60s and after it was vulnerable because so went Boeing, so went Seattle. Yeah. And so, but there were, did she talk about the uh, ecological theories that were also at play at the same time, the diversity and incrementalism? Uh, because that's where it seems like in a parallel, but the, I don't even hear her mentioning it. Very often. Sure. So, so the let me let me just figure it out. So, the fourth part of this book is called the the ecology of cities. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she and she had a book called the nature of economies. Right. So, but yeah. so she she was she actually was a, a really big believer of that um, there were sort of certain uh, principles I guess that underlie economies that are very very similar to ecology, um, and and particularly exactly what you were saying about. 
um, you know, diversity and, and incrementalism and all of these sorts of things, feedback loops. Um, say, those, the, say the bit about organized complexity that I was reading. Sure. Know, right, so. so even actually going back as far as the death and life of great American cities, she ends that book uh, talking about this idea of organized complexity, which she steals from uh, ecology and, and the sort of emerging life sciences of that time. Uh, and I'm trying to remember who the, the scientist is. Is it Norbert oh. Wiener or is it no, the, that's no, the other systems one? systems theory. What's that guy's name? Anyway. Blanking. Before, even before way before that, that yeah, but, uh, but that's, that's very much a, of Same a moment. Idea. Yeah, the Schumacher moment is a, is a right. Jacobs moment, and, and too. The, the Although I think, I'm not so sure, so sure how well they would the, the, the Schumacher moment. Institute actually <laughs> loves Jane Jacobs. Sure they do. But, but they, they did differ on certain things. She actually critiques uh, Schumacher in The Economy of Cities, I think. Or no, it's the other one, Cities and the Wealth of Nations. The whole idea of appropriate technology, which was that we could kind of like use... Uh, local resources in foreign aid to, to produce like machinery that would help people in, in other countries be more productive. She, she, she had a big critique of that. But, um, but yeah, if you look through Jacob's writing, especially in the later area, she talks a lot about that sort of thing. And it's, it's through there throughout her, her writing, yeah. And, yeah. and she actually loved landscape architects um, and, and a lot of the ideas that was, were coming out of landscape architecture. Back again to the Route 195 oh. project. <laughs> oh. If Jane were alive, if she could take a look at it, uh, would she find parcels that were small enough for a small developer? Because she liked small projects. Would can a small developer get a foothold in in that all that empty land over there, or does it have to be a big project? Or how big does it have to be? I mean, I think you'd have to ask a developer. I mean, oh, I thought this gentleman might know from Providence. Uh, I mean, I, I would hate to be the try to be the expert on this, but it does seem like they have they have designed that to be um, attractive to to large developers who I I think it's probably a problem. Yeah, yeah. I it's that again. I don't know. That's that's what went down in the South Boston waterfront as well. Yeah. Uh, was that was that it was the the parcels kind of dictated partly what was built. Yeah, it's a very useful idea. Yeah. Um, but, but then the difficulty is that sometimes small parcels can make the economics of it too difficult. Right. Uh, or, or so developers would tell would you. tell you, yeah. Who knows if that's true, but certain developers, yeah. yeah. Along those lines, she seems to have been not only a, a fabulous writer, but a community organizer, too. She seems to have been really successful at getting people to organize and make change. Can you talk about how how she did that and maybe how she might even approach. Yeah. Do you want me to take New York and you take Toronto? Sure. All right. So um, <laughs> that's how we usually break these things up. So yeah, so Jacobs was a, was a, and, and I guess the theme of this should be she was a reluctant community organizer. She thought of herself first and foremost as a writer. She wanted to be left alone to sit in her, in her office in her study and write her books. But she found herself, as she would often say, uh, having to face off against a, a series of absurd plans in her life. She loved the word absurd. Uh, and so she, uh, this began in the 1950s in New York where she found herself uh, confronted with, um, not just herself, but there was already a bunch of people, she didn't even know about it for a long time, it had been going on throughout the 1950s, uh, who were fighting against Robert Moses' plans to run a, a highway, not a highway, a road through Washington Square Park, become a very famous fight. She got in late on that, but she was involved in that, um, involved in that battle. And then there were several more uh, in New York, particularly a, a, an urban renewal plan, a sort of latter-day urban renewal plan, which was attempting, actually, and you can read my first book about some of this, uh, Manhattan Projects, which tells you about, uh, which can tell you about the, the sort of ways that there were already a series of reforms going through in reaction to people like her who were critiquing urban renewal. Uh, but she helped to kill that plan and institute a, 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 um, a plan for, for, for Greenwich Village uh, that was then instituted an alternative plan called the West Village Houses, which is eventually built. Um, and then she was involved with the plans to try to stop uh, over a, a period of about a decade, a series of, of roadways that were to be run, going to be run through Manhattan too, famously the Lower Manhattan Expressway, where she ended up um, being one of the leaders of this uh, movement to, to try to stop it. And this precipitated her uh, feelings of, of uh, anxiety and um, dismay at what was happening in the United States in the middle of the 1960s. And so right about the time that she gives that speech in London, she and her family are preparing to leave for Toronto, in part because, in part because of her dismay over what was happening in urban and also because she had draft-age sons, and she had been very involved with the protests against the Vietnam War, had been arrested for it. There's a great picture in the book, uh, which I will find, of her sitting in, the, in uh, bo central booking in New York, uh, 
um, if I'm good enough, it'll pop up soon, <laughs> with, um, yeah, here it is, with, uh, with Susan Sontag. Um, in, 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 in Central Booking, New York, waiting to be booked for, for after being arrested at a big anti-war rally in 1967. And not long after this, in 1968, they decamp sort of uh, in the middle of the night for Toronto, uh, where she arrives and... And um, immediately realizes that the apartment that she's moved into uh, is in the path of an expressway. <laughs> right. and, and so um, she, she then... Uh, gets involved in another another ongoing battle that had already started before she got there to kill the Spadina Expressway in Toronto uh, that would have sort of gone from the north all the way downtown uh, to the heart of the city. Um, and through that, that's kind of how she met a lot of the, the major players in the Toronto political scene for the following like 50 years, basically. Um, a lot of them are still really active in, in Toronto politics. Um, and... Uh, Around that time, there was a reform city council movement. So there were there were a number of community organizers actually that decided they wanted to run for council, um, and they actually swept to power. They didn't have quite a majority, but the mayor uh, and and a, a, almost I think more than a third of of the councilors were all part of the reform city council in Toronto. Uh, that was the 1972 election, and so they basically just changed the way that business was being done top to bottom. Uh, including particularly reforms around um, community involvement in all kinds of governance. There were a lot of community councils about various issues. Um, you know, everything from, you know, like police reform to city planning issues. They, they actually, one of my favorite reforms, which uh, Jacobs talks about in a speech in here, was that they actually had local city planning offices that two neighborhoods. So, if, so basically, the, the, um, at City Hall, if they identified a neighborhood that was either going through gentrification or a negative like, you know, spi spiral of decline in one way or another because there's a lot of crime or whatever, they would actually locate a uh, city planning office in a storefront of that neighborhood um, that, would, that would then be working on a secondary plan, as, as we call it in Ontario, for that neighborhood. Anyone could walk in off the street um, you, could, you could kind of see in at what people were doing, uh, and eventually they started adding services that you would usually get at City Hall to these offices. So you could walk in and get a permit, for instance, uh, for, for work on your house or whatever. Um, so that kind of built up these really interesting relationships between city planners that were working in these smaller teams and the local community. Uh, and eventually, I, I actually spoke to a, uh, one of the city planners that was involved in this recently, and I asked him, well, what happened? Why don't we have that anymore? And he said, Money in politics, <laughs> um, and so it was. It was killed in the nineteen uh, after the nineteen nineties um, recession. Basically, they they saw it as fat to trim, and it was gone. Um, but you know now that was that was bef long before the internet, long before a lot of the things that would make that sort of decentralized uh, administration work. Right. She well. also influenced the sort of decentralization in some ways of government in New York, but it was far more reactive than proactive. Right. But it's interesting to say, I mean, I think that her, her long history of, of community organizing was also, um, was also often about trying to figure out, uh, she, was very, she was very vociferously about saying no to things, which is in some ways why, we, why she has sort of become a patron saint of nimbyism, so to speak. Uh, but on the other hand, she, has, she, was always, uh, she was always thinking about what it was you would want to do instead of... Uh, beyond the no, she, it was all about when you started to bring out your your alternative plan. You couldn't bring it out too early because then you would become part of the process. So you needed to say no until something was dead, and then figure out where to to bring the alternative plan in mm -hmm. later on. And she was, you know, relatively successful about uh, about trying to figure out how to generate, uh, following her own ideas, generate new ideas in in urban space. More so in Toronto than New York, mm -hmm. uh, where it was quite a bit more inflexible. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, we're probably running out of time now. Um, continue the conversation, because I know people have books that they would love to sign, have sure. signed, and some people would like to buy books. Um, but we can keep talking. Yeah. Um, we'll go over there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.